This is the Ugreen DXP 8800 Plus. This thing is an absolute monster and finds itself in a real nice spot when you compare it to other NASs that are available on the market today. One thing that a lot of you have brought up when I had reviewed the 4-bay unit was how good is the read cache when you put in the NVMe slot. And I'm pleased to report that it's absolutely bananas, as you can see right here. We'll touch base more in that in a moment. We're going to catch up to this. This video is not sponsored. Ugreen has not paid me any money. They have had no editorial oversight on this. They have not been able to change anything that I've said. All of these are my own opinions. In fact, when you're looking at this video, it'll be the first time that Ugreen has seen it as well. I have spent around $2,000 of my own money making this NAS better. So I've purchased eight 20 terabyte hard drives. That cost me around $1,700 with tax and shipping. I bought a one terabyte NVMe and 32 gigs of RAM to spruce this up. Now, the Kickstarter had two different prices for early bird prices. The first version was $900, and then they had a $975 version as well. That included tax and shipping. What is really nice with what they do offer, if we just take a look at the specs, they do include that really nice Intel i5-1235U. That is a lot of compute. It only goes up to about 50 watt. Now, the one thing that we have to talk about thermals-wise is you're not going to be able to hit 50 watt all the time it will actually hit 100 degrees Celsius quite often if you try to push it too much. So power-wise, you're actually going to be using considerably less. You're going to be around the 30-watt area, which is still very good for a low-power, high-compute type of NAS on this device for its price range. Typically, when you take a look at other NAS offerings, for a low-power device, you're going to get anemic ARM cores, and then if you want more power, you're going to start spending like two or $3,000. Then you're going to have enterprise parts with more high-power Xeon stuff. Then you're going to be using 100, 150 watts. So there's not been a nice middle ground here. And that's what I really like about the DXP8800 Plus specifically is the chip that they use with and what's on offer. What you get there is only eight gigs of RAM, the whole NAS enclosure, the power supply included, two 10 gigabit NICs, and a bunch of expansion slots on here. When we take a look at the expansion ports, we have a full SD card slot that you can quickly plug in if you need to access that. There are expandable Thunderbolt 4. So if there are different ways to expand via that, you do have that capability. On the front, we have a USB-A port that is USB 3.2 Gen 2 as well. On the back, we have an additional PCIe slot. That's a half height PCIe slot, but it is PCI 4X4 slot. There is an HDMI port here. Now, this is something that I was very interested in because I was hoping that I would be able to leverage other operating systems. That's outside of this review. Right now with the Ugreen OS, this HDMI outputs to basically a static screen that doesn't give you any usage at all. Right next to that, we have another USB-A, USB 3.2 Gen 2 slot, and then two USB 2 slots, and then the dual 10 gigabit copper NICs. Those are the base specs and what you can expect to get out of the DXP8800 Plus. Now you can upgrade that like I have upgraded my machine. Again, I spent almost $2,000. I put eight 20 terabyte hard drives. I put an additional 32 gigs of RAM. I took out the initial eight gig and a one terabyte NVMe that I've attached to the array that is the read cache. If I wanted to assign a write cache as well, I'd have to buy another NVMe, which I have not done yet which I think I may very well do. Ultimately, what this gives me is 127 terabytes of usable space on my particular RAID. Now, I'm using RAID 5 because I only want to use one disk for parity, so I'm sacrificing one disk of space for a parity disk. This is not the best, but right now I am using this particular NAS as a backup to my primary NAS. So when looking at it through that angle, I am not really concerned if I burn a disk or two and I lose my data set because I still have a proper data set, and right now I'm, I need as much space as I possibly can. If you were going to be using this in a production capacity, I would really say using RAID 10 would be a far better idea. You'd have much more redundancy as well as IO and speed. Now I've already done an in-depth look at the Ugreen OS, especially on the four bay unit. So I'm not gonna retread all of that because there's a lot of information. So I'm gonna summarize a lot of it. Basically what it comes down to, it's still a bare bone OS. And with eight gigs of RAM, you're still fine for that pretty much enterprise use as well, because you can join a domain, create a domain, do simple backups, create file shares for Windows or Linux and have that join and do all that type of stuff. So if you wanted to have a clean and simple file store that can do domain type of stuff, it can do that today. But if you were looking to have applications that are available on Synology with the wealth of apps that are available on Synology, that's not where Ugreen is just yet. Right now, if you wanted to do all that, you're going to have to do a lot of the work yourself, either using Docker containers or using the KVM virtual machine that they provide for you, which is a really cool application. It's basically just KVM QMU that they provide to you through a GUI interface so you can quickly and easily get that set up. And it's alarmingly fast to get that set up. However, you can set it up wrong. You can set it up so that the virtual machine that you're going to be in there will be rather slow for it. So if you want to get the most performance out of that, I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. 
to set up a KVM QMU virtual machine, what you're going to do is you're going to open up the virtual machine app. You're going to go to manage and then you're going to go to image. From here, you can upload an ISO. Now, there's a few things that you can do here. They will just be mounted as CD drives on whatever KVM that you have. So when you upload an ISO of like Windows Server, you're going to upload the Windows Server ISO to there. And then you're going to attach that when you create the KVM, which is on the next part. Now, in this particular instance, the new VM that we're going to be looking at is Windows Server 2022. I'm selecting Windows Server 2016 as the system type. For CPU cores, I'm giving it 10. You can choose whatever you want. For memory, I have 32 gigs of RAM total, so I'm giving it 24. This is the important part. When you take a look at disk and network and everything else, you want to use VertIO. VertIO will need drivers, and I'm going to show you how to use that in just a second. Especially on graphics card, you're going to want VertIO as well, but this will need drivers. Again, when we take a look at uploading an image and managing that, when you click on the Manage tab, the latest VertIO win drivers are 0.1.262. You're going to go ahead and upload this ISO and then go ahead and attach those two ISOs to your server. So again, just go ahead into the KVM that you set up. This says Windows Server 2022. You can see the image that I have specified is the Windows Server 22 image, but I'm also going to include that vert IO thing in here. I'm just going to go back in the settings just so you can see that, again, all of the choices that I have for the disk network and graphics are all vert IO. That's important because that's going to, once all the drivers are installed, give us the most amount of speed as possible. Once we go ahead and click start, you can go ahead and click connect and it'll instantly jump you into a VNC connection, which is super nice, fast, and easy. From here, you're going to see the Windows startup part. You're going to go ahead and click next. Now, when you click install and say yes to all of this, what you're going to notice is in the disk drives, it's completely empty. So what you're going to have to do is go ahead and click load driver, click browse, go to the CD drive that is the vert win IO ISO that you did. Go to AMD 64. When you go to AMD 64, you're going to see 2K 2022. This is Windows Server 2022. And then you're going to see the Red Hat VertIO SCSI controller driver. Click next, and then from here, you can go ahead and install Windows Server 2022. One thing to quickly note is that this process will take a while. Right now, as it's loading, it's not actually using the driver in a loaded state. When you have to actually load up Windows and then install VertIO again. We're going to show you that right here. So when you first power on Windows, you're going to see that all of these have drivers that are not detected. Now that ISO is still connected. So if you go ahead and click on Windows Explorer, it's going to open up and in the DRE drive, you're going to see VertIO win 0.1.262 or whatever version you have. Go ahead and use the x64 version. This is the version that you should be running so that you can use more than four gigabytes of RAM, but you should always be using the 64-bit version of whatever your operating system you're going to be installing. Go ahead and just install everything. And then this is going to take a while. This machine is still pretty slow at the moment. But after all of this is installed, you're going to see that your system is a blazingly fast. And after everything's installed, you're going to see that the Red Hat VertIO SCSI controller is going to say you need to restart for it to probably be in use. At this point, everything in the device manager will be nice and clean and all of your drivers will be installed, at which point you can go ahead and restart your machine. At this point, you can go ahead and log into your machine. Everything's going to be blazingly fast. One of the nice things is because Linux is on the back end, we're using ext4 RAID 5, and we have that NVMe as our cache. When we go ahead and test that speed, you can see, again, that our speeds are ludicrously fast. We take a look at our write speeds. I'm only getting around 385 megabytes a second on write speeds for that RAID 5 array. Now, we're not going to get very good write speeds on a RAID 5 array, but if we take a look at our read speeds, they're ludicrously good because it's leveraging that one terabyte NVMe read cache. And all of those benefits just automatically come over to your KVM. So if you were looking to do not just Windows, but any particular operating system that you wanted to, you're going to get all those speeds on the front end. So effectively, you could have whatever operating system you want whatever server operating system that you want and just have the Ugreen OS kind of running in the background, kind of keeping things running. Now, not that this is terribly impressive as well, but just so we can see that if I do an internet speed test, it's using up all of my available bandwidth on my home internet, which is only 300 megabits up and down, but it saturates that no problem. So everything that we're looking at of this machine that you possibly want to get out of it, we're getting all the available performance out of it with the one caveat that we do not yet have IOMMU. Now, I've talked to you, Green, about this. They are still working on this. If we had IOMMU, basically what we can get is we can have that really nice juicy GPU, iGPU that is on the 1235U, and give that GPU to your KVM. In this instance, for Windows Server 2022, we could load up our Intel GPU drivers and then make, make use of transcoding and GPU within the KVM itself. So hopefully... Ugreen is able to get IOMMU working because that's literally the last step needed if you wanted to have a full-powered Plex server 
with all the niceties of Linux running in the back end. Now, obviously you don't have to use Windows Server 2022 here. You can use any particular operating system that you want and have just the Ugreen OS be something that handles all the stuff in the background and then just use the foreground KVM QMU operating system to do all the things that you wanna do and treat that as your primary server interface for the Ugreen OS. Then you don't really have to worry about lack of apps and whatnot because you just have a big beefy server that is the front end for your Ugreen NAS. You could also use Docker containers if you didn't wanna use a virtual machine. Docker containers are going to be a lot more performant and not need as much RAM because they're gonna be running on the system itself. And you can do other operating systems as well. You don't necessarily need to, or you could just do applications. Like you could do Plex in a Docker container that'll run on the Ugreen NAS. Now, the only thing that you have to be aware of is that when you're using a Docker container that you're going to have to be in full control and taking and administrating all of the file permissions that are on there. Typically for Plex, there's gonna be a user called ABC that they use. Now you can change that to be whatever you want, but ABC is going to need to have permissions on whatever is on the NAS that it's connected to so that if you have Plex and it needs to access any of that media, it's going to need to have permissions to actually access it. So there's a bit more involved to getting Plex running on the Docker container. It's not terribly difficult, but just be aware that there are other steps involved to bridge the gap for what that application will be able to access on your Ugreen OS, as opposed to the virtual machine, which is, is going to be this isolated container. Really, the choice is up to you. You can do the virtual machine route and dedicate all the resources to it, or you can use Docker and try to be a lot more lean with how you have to do it, but just manage all the file permissions in there and how that's going to get access. So it's entirely up to you on how you want to approach this. On the In the operating system side, and so far as the Windows Server side, if I, you wanted to, you can give it more space available to it. So in this instance, I'm giving it 100 terabytes. Again, I'm using the Vert.io driver. Once we go back into Windows, you can see that it's there. We have to initialize it as a GPT drive. We have to format it and then assign it a drive letter. From there, I'm calling the D drive NAS drive. You can see that it is 100 terabytes that are formatted as a D drive in Windows Server 2022, which is just leveraging the array that is on the Ugreen NAS OS itself. So this is what you can do in the types of feature and functionality. But when it comes down to what applications are there, Ugreen has like a photo app and a video app. Honestly, I would say don't even use them. They aren't very good at all. All of the Docker containers or using a virtual machine is going to give you something that's far better of an experience than using those particular applications. But it's still early days yet and software can change and be updated and made better. So this is something that we're going to have to take a look at as time goes on. Right now, the biggest feature that I would love for Ugreen to have is giving IO MMU support on the Docker container as well as the virtual machine. In either situation, either in the Docker container or on the virtual machine, on the virtual machine within the GUI interface itself, there is no option on the graphic side to choose IO MMU basically to extend the iGPU to the virtual machine itself. And then on the Docker container itself, trying to share the iGPU with the Docker container, I've had a lot of difficulties just getting that to even function. Whenever I try to attach it, it would try to attach it and then the Docker container would fail to start completely. That may just be a configuration part on my end, but I've not been able to get any instance of the integrated GPU extend to the Docker container or to the virtual machine. Hopefully that gets updated on the Ugreen side. At the very least, I would like it for it to have IOMMU on the virtual machine side. That would be able, that would leverage us to be able to have our cake and eat it too. The bottom line that I want to get across to you guys is that the Ugreen DXP8800 Plus has it where it counts. On the hardware side, this thing is beefy. On the software side, that is still developing and it's fairly bare bones, but you can take it to the next level either with Docker containers or with a virtual machine. On both of those sides, you can actually push it to the limit and the system will respond and give you that performance. Like you saw, we were getting nine gigabytes a second on our read cache from that one NVMe stick. And all that is handled by the backend Linux system tra transferring over to the Windows KVM side. Even without that, we we're getting around 330 megabytes a second on writes, but I only have a RAID 5 configuration. If I were to go to RAID 10, that would beef up quite considerably. I would have more IO and more speed. So it really comes down to the array that I'm using, which the write speeds are so slow. But if I were to put another NVMe stick for the write cache, I would be flying on how fast this thing would be on IO side. And even when you get down to the network side, because of the 2.5 gigabit network that I have for my house, the maximum speeds that I can transfer at are about 271 megabytes a second sustained. And I've been able to do that on this particular system. So it has it where it counts. The only thing is, is that the heatsink solution that is on this particular device 
isn't as good as the cooling solution for the hard drives themselves. Now, when we're pushing the system as hard as it can, there is an area here where a U-Green could make things better. Now, it may be up to me to try to make a better heatsink fan solution for this particular unit, but if I'm pushing this device as hard as I can on the CPU side, we actually do have areas where the CPU reaches 100 degrees Celsius and then throttles down. So performance will tank down a bit to cool off the chip and then go down to about 70 degrees Celsius. So you can inadvertently push this machine too hard with regard to the heatsink fan solution that is on here. On the opposite side, if you were to look at how it cools down the hard drives, it is absolutely perfect. And honestly, that's something that I care about more. The chip can handle going 100 degrees Celsius and then cooling itself down and just, you know, handling clocks. For the hard drives themselves, putting the fan speed at full speed, it's still very quiet, but I want you to take a look at the temperatures of my hard disks. All of them are 33 degrees Celsius, but take a look at the NVMe, which is 41 degrees Celsius, which doesn't isn't getting cooled at all. It's not terribly hot, but those hard drives are fantastically cool. So if you want to increase the longevity of the hard drives themselves and have the best lifespan that you can out of those hard disks, keeping those hard disks cool is most important. And the Ugreen NAS does it fantastically. It has two gigantic fans that is pushing a ton of air that you can clearly feel right ugh, on the front of the device. Like all of the air that comes out over here, it's a ton of air and it's keeping those hard disks nice and cool. And really that's what I mostly care about for this NAS. For me, I'm more of a tinkerer and I'm more of an enthusiast. So the bare bones situation that is on the Ugreen NAS OS is actually fine for me because I don't mind using a KVM in front. I still would love to have IOMMU because then I would be able to leverage that iGPU and then I'd be able to do a whole bunch of transcoding features on the Plex side very easy and keep it absolutely bonkers low power. As it is right now, typical usage is going to be around 90 to 100 watts of power in use from the wall, which is very low power for eight drives spinning at the same time and the system being busy and doing stuff. This can spike and go up to about 130 watts if you really push the CPU, but even at 130 watts for 8 bay with NVMe and 32 gigs of RAM, this is still a very low power NAS compared to other NASs that are available and way more low power when compared to my primary NAS that is still running today. So I eventually hope to transition off my primary, primary NAS and move over to this, but I'm still in like a testing phase for this and I'm still kind of pushing a lot of data to this end. This is more of a backup for me right now, as opposed to my primary. On the hardware side, they do everything very right. The only caveat that I would say is that I would like them to try to beef up the heatsink fan solution on the CPU itself. I would rather that try to stay as high as 90 degrees Celsius when we're pushing that as hard as it can. Having that allowable to go up to 100 degrees Celsius with however the fans not touching it is something that I would like to see them improve upon. But as it is, you get a tremendous amount of compute for a very low power device and finds itself price-wise kind of nice compared to the competition. I hope this video was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.